Welcome Sailor Moon. We're starting it off right. Today we are talking about breast cancer. So I did a very long involved talk about breast cancer for the PA students at UAB. It's about an hour long. It has slides. It goes over pretty much everything there is to know about breast cancer that you can slide into an hour. What we decided to do here is this is pretty much a patient oriented video. So if you're looking for the deep and dirty information about breast cancer, then go to that one and I'll post it as lecture 12A or 12B or something like that. But right now we're talking about if you are a patient and you walk into an office and someone says you have an abnormal mammogram or if they say you have a breast mass, what do you do? This is the general information that you need to know. First things first, what is a breast mass? Breast mass is a nodule or overgrowth of breast tissue. These can be benign, such as a fibroadenoma or malignant, like an invasive ductal carcinoma, which is the most common type. They can be solid, like a cancer or a fibroadenoma, or they can be cystic, like a cystic, benign cystic lesion, um, lactocele, stuff like that. Breasts normally have cysts in them from time to time, and it's not always abnormal. They can also be solid and not abnormal. The whole thing about breast cancer or breast disease is figuring out whether something is likely to be benign or malignant and then go from there. Now, from a patient standpoint, you're looking at is the mass look like this, feel like this, does it do this, does it not do this? These are pretty much all the things that we look for in symptoms. Soft versus firm versus hard. That gives us an idea as to whether or not it's a fibroadenoma or just dense breast tissue or cancer. If there's redness, it's an infection, maybe it's an uh, inflammatory breast cancer. Mobile fixed, again, fixed cancer, mobile fibroadenoma. Dimpling, such as pute orange, which is essentially breast cancer involving the skin that causes skin changes that we treat with usually chemotherapy first before we do surgery. Tender versus non-tender, tender mass, you consider cysts that are growing or abscesses. Nipple discharge versus retraction. Nipple discharge, if it's bloody, you sometimes worry about cancer in that situation, but not as much. Um, versus a green discharge is usually an infection, creamy discharge infection. Retraction means something is pulling the nipple backwards, which sometimes is a sign of cancer. And then is, there's a change in size. No two breasts are the exact same size unless my brother Marcus Crawford, Atlanta Plastics, he had a reality TV show, but Crawford Plastic Surgery, unless a plastic surgeon puts them in, they're not going to be the exact same size. And even plastic surgeons usually don't make them the exact same size just because it looks unnatural. But they're all different. But if you have a B and a C and you turn up with a B and a D a couple of days later, then we have to start looking at stuff. And this also has to do with the patient and what they're on. If they're on a blood thinner and they bump themselves, one breast may change in size versus the other. You may have redness, um, not so much pute orange, but redness on your breast. So a good clinical history and what's going on with you globally as a patient, that helps us use the sign and symptoms to determine what we're going to do next. Now, once you see the physician in the office, we're going to ask you a couple of questions. Um, pretty much the list that I always use is when was your first period? When was your last period? When did you have your first child? When did you have your last child? Have you had a hysterectomy? Have you ever had a breast biopsy? Any first degree relatives younger than 50 that have had breast cancer? If you've had a biopsy, how many biopsies have you had? Um, that's pretty much the run of the, li the list that I use. But what we're looking at is, is there a family history of breast cancer? How many surgeries? changes in a mass over time, changes in your breast habits. So were your breasts doing fine and now they're draining? Were they doing fine? Started draining over weeks, months? Was this change over years? History, clinical evaluation. Now, once we do a physical exam, there are a bunch of different types of exams to do. 
you can do one called the magic fingers. The other ones are circular where you do circular motion start in the outs in the round the nipple and go around kind of making a swirl versus starting from one side and going to the other using what I call magic fingers. I am a magic finger dude. I like the magic finger technique. I think you get a better exam. I think you can more easily determine whether someone has a dense breast tissue versus a mass. I think you're less likely to miss small lesions with magic fingers. But again, that's what I was taught. That's what I was, that's what I do. And it works well for me. So realistically stick with what you are taught. Um, from a self breast exam standpoint, magic fingers is hard because you're kind of going from this side to this side. So that's why you'll see all of the, um, books that they teach or anything they hand out, you have one hand here. And the reason you do that is because if you have a breast that's large and you put your hand up, it actually flattens it against the chest wall a little better. We'll go through the anatomy of um, breasts at a later date, but realistically nipple areola, and it actually has a teardrop appearance to the tail of spence, which goes up here. So when they talk about doing the circle, this is how you should do it on this side, switch hands and here and do it this from the inside out to see if you find any masses. They also recommend doing that in the shower because that's a good time to do it, which I also recommend. <clears throat> now, as far as in the office, a bimanual exam, sitting, supine, it also includes the axilla to look at lymph nodes. So if your physician is not examining your axilla, they're not doing a complete breast examination. It includes your breast and your armpits because lymph node status, as we'll talk about later, is one of the m most important things that we find out during, during this whole breast process. Excuse me, it just ain't lunch. Now, from a Sailor Moon standpoint, I don't know how old she is now, but she's been around for a while. She's been working out apparently. Start self breast examination at the age of 20. That's almost at the time where women are starting to finish puberty. So we always assume that if they're going to start having malignant transformation, then it is probably going to be the earliest that it can be detected. That does not mean that you can't have breast cancer before 20. It just means that is the earliest. If you are looking at normal development, that's when it'll start. We'll come back to the survival uh, information at the very end. Diagnosis. Palpable mass in your breast, you have to see your healthcare provider. He or she will then determine what the next step is. This is a general tree. This tree, if we expanded it out and included everybody, would encompass everything, including Sailor Moon, and she'd have to get out of the way. So this is a truncated version, but it is a really good guide for you to know what's going to happen when you see your doctor. Under the age of 30, we typically do ultrasound first as call it a screening or looking at a mass that is palpable. If we find something, then we will add mammogram to it. A mammogram should always be done before you biopsy a breast. Let me say that one more time. A mammogram should be done almost always before you biopsy a breast. The only known reasonable caveat is if you suspect someone has a breast abscess and you are planning to drain it and it looks, smells, tastes, sounds, everything like a breast abscess, then that's okay. Outside of that, you need a mammogram first. The main reason is if you come into your office, come into my office and you have a mass that you feel and I biopsy it first without a mammogram, it comes back abnormal. I have to get a mammogram later. There's no way for the radiologist to say whether it's abnormal because of my breast biopsy or that's what it looks like. So 
if you haven't had a mammogram and you walk into a surgeon's office, whether it's a breast surgeon, general surgeon, whoever, you're more than likely not going to get a biopsy until you get that mammogram done. Sometimes we use ultrasound, especially if you're young and it's a cyst, then sometimes we'll do that. But even in that situation, a lot of times we'll get a baseline mammogram just to make sure that we know what we're dealing with. Now, let's say your mammogram or your ultrasound come back abnormal, okay? If it's a simple cyst, you aspirate it, suck out the fluid, and that's it. This actually in itself is optional. If it's a small cyst and you don't want it and you want to watch it, that's fine. Simple cyst in the breast, especially when diagnosed by ultrasound, can come back. So we can stick a needle in them and it comes back and it's not a big deal. Now, if you stick a needle in them because they're very large and they come back three or four times, then we will consider excising them. But fine needle aspiration is a good way to confirm that it's benign and it usually is. If you're under the age of 30, ultrasound mammogram show a complex cyst or a solid mass, then you proceed to biopsy. One other thing, the goal in breast is to get a biopsy of the mass before we proceed to the operating room. That doesn't mean that the biopsy will prevent you from having to get to the operating room, but we like to know what we're dealing with. So if it's abnormal, we try to figure out a way to get a diagnosis before surgery, whether that is stereotactic, ultrasound guided, uh, mammotone, um, whatever, trying to sample microcalcifications. The goal is to get a biopsy before we proceed with surgery. So if you come in, have an abnormal mammogram, know that more than likely there's going to be a period that you have to wait for the results of your biopsy before we proceed with surgery. Again, always some different reasons, but globally think of it this way. If I take you to the operating room off of an abnormal mammogram without trying to get a biopsy first, you have one operation. Then it comes back cancer, I have to do a second operation. Versus if I biopsy it in my office, get that diagnosis of cancer, then we can talk about lumpectomy versus mastectomy, and then you only have one surgery. So we're trying to save you a surgery, and it's always helpful to know, especially if you need to do preoperative chemotherapy, maybe, maybe not radiation if you have positive lymph nodes, and a breast cancer that we need to shrink to do breast conservative therapy. Breast conservative therapy means save the breast or lumpectomy versus mastectomy means removing the breast. Now, complex cystic mass solid image guided core biopsy. Again, multiple ways to do it. That will tell us whether it's benign, DCIS, or cancer. Let me get this one and then we'll talk about it. Now, over the age of 30, this flip flops. We use mammogram first. We do ultrasound if necessary, if we're concerned about it being a simple cyst or a complex cyst, or sometimes some masses don't show up on, mammo on mammogram as well as they do ultrasound, so that's why it's an added modality. In this situation, it can still come back complex cyst, simple cyst, doesn't matter, but if it's suspicious for malignancy, you then again have to have an image-guided core biopsy. So, these two join back to one at this point. Now, a couple things about mammograms. Mammogram, pretty much um, the radiologist reads it or a breast surgeon will read it or a general surgeon will read it and then they'll give you a reading. Um, there's a classification called BIRADS and I'll put the exactly what it means right under here. BIRADS is how the radiologist or whoever's interpreting the mammogram communicates what they see and what they recommend to the surgeon operating or the medical oncologist. From a patient standpoint, it's BIRADS 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. From a healthcare professional, it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 1 means it's normal. Nothing to, nothing to see. Two means there's an abnormality there, but it appears to be benign, so nothing else to do other than continue your regularly 
screenings. Three means there's an abnormality there and either I don't have enough information because I don't have a previous mammogram, it's been time since you've had a recent mammogram, and I would like to do more films to make sure this is benign or malignant. So a BIRAS 3, that means you have to get a mammogram at the very least every six months for two years. Now in that time, they will either downgrade you to a 2 or upgrade you to a 4. A BIRADS 4, what that essentially means is that there's an abnormality there. That abnormality is suspicious for cancer and you need to get a biopsy. Even saying that, a BIRADS 4, 85% of the time is benign. So it still doesn't mean you have cancer, it just means you have an abnormality that is suspicious. BIRADS 5 means your mammogram looks like it is cancerous. It looks exactly like biopsies, I mean a mass that has had a biopsy in the past from someone else and it was a cancer. Now, for the healthcare professional BIRADS 0, that means we don't have enough information. So if you get a mammogram, they read it as a BIRADS 0, they'll have to do additional films. BIRADS 6 means you've had a mammogram that was a 5, we biopsied it, you now have cancer diagnosis and there's a mammogram and nothing has changed. Uh, we see that every once in a while with someone that has either slipped through the cracks or they have something that is preventing us from being able to treat their breast cancer and they have to get another mammogram. The other thing is when do you start mammograms? The current rule is 50 or 10 years earlier if you have a family member that was diagnosed with breast cancer. So that puts us at 40. Some people start screening mammograms at 40. I will leave it up to your healthcare provider. Some people start at 35. Um, again, that 40 comes from 50 minus 10 years. 35, 35, 40. That is also changed as to whether you do it every year. If you start doing mammograms every year at the age of 30 till someone is 75 or 80, you run the risk of causing a cancer or causing uh, something, an abnormality, because of the amount of radiation that you've given someone. So because of that amount of radiation, that's why we've changed that recommendation. If you're starting early, you can't do every year. You need to do once every year to once every two years or once every three years, depending on your family history and what we find. Now, benign DCIS cancer. Benign is not just benign, leave me alone. It can be a fibroadenoma, it can be uh, sclerosing adenosis. There are a couple of things that when you add them up, they equal fibrocystic disease. Um, we talk about that when we say lumpy, bumpy breast. It's a pathological evaluation. It means you've had a biopsy and it came back with one of these things. Doesn't necessarily put you at risk for breast cancer. What it does say is that you have abnormalities that have shown up on mammogram and you need to be followed closely. DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, is a precancerous lesion that is a complex um, entity, but very simple. Realistically, DCIS, you need to have negative margins, remove it, that can be via lumpectomy or mastectomy. If you do a lumpectomy, which is just removing that area, and you get a negative margin, you have to do radiation. If you do a mastectomy and remove it, you don't have to do radiation. If you have um, a high-grade dysplasia type of DCIS, we will sometimes recommend lymph nodes, intermediate, it's up to your surgeon. If it's palpable DCIS, we recommend sampling lymph nodes at your diagnosis. Breast cancer, go look at the webs, go look at the others lecture, but pretty much lumpectomy versus mastectomy, same thing, stage for stage, long-term morbidity mortality. Now, if you have a big mass, we may want to shrink it ahead of time. Um, and then you may get your chemotherapy ahead of time. Radiation sometimes, sometimes not. Um, but realistically with breast cancer, you still have that same question. 
And that question is, am I going to do breast conservative therapy, which means lumpectomy, removing the breast cancer, radiation to the breast afterwards, sampling the lymph nodes, and then determining whether or not we need chemotherapy and radiation after the stage versus mastectomy, which is removing the breast, removing the entire breast and sampling the lymph nodes. If you do that, then the only time you would need radiation is if you have positive lymph nodes in your axilla. So the most important thing for breast cancer to tell you what we are um, recommending is knowing the stage. Uh, tumor size. Yes, I switched cards. So anyway, um, breast cancer. The real question is whether you would like to keep the breast or remove the breast. Breast conservative therapy, lumpectomy, means you have to have radiation to that breast as well. Versus mastectomy, you remove the entire breast. You don't have to have radiation to the chest wall. Now, if you have positive lymph nodes, that may change. So think of it as there are two recommendations. Lumpectomy with sentinel lymph node, possibly axillary node dissection if your lymph nodes are positive, versus mastectomy, which is removing the breast, and sentinel lymph node biopsy, axillary node dissection, if your lymph nodes are positive. If you have a breast cancer and you want to do bilateral mastectomy, that is a conversation to have with your surgeon. That's reasonable in certain situations, but for the most part, it's always an option. But keeping your breast is also reasonable, and a lot of women choose that. Understand if you choose mastectomy, you now have the opportunity for reconstruction. Reconstruction, whether it's a deep fat flap, a latissimus flap, or um, any other type of flap, a tram flap, you're talking about multiple operations. And those operations are timed depending on the stage of your cancer. That pretty much covers breast from a what is it, how does it work, and then once I get my diagnosis. Now there are a couple things that we do need to talk about as far as stage. Now remember, we can't stage your breast cancer until we have done your definitive surgery. So that means you have your breast cancer removed and we have staged your lymph nodes. In some situations, if you're doing breast conservative therapy and you have a very large breast mass, we sometimes will do your sentinel lymph node and axillary node dissection before that if necessary. But again, the algorithm keeps going. Generally speaking, this is some information that is helpful when you're talking about stage. And remember stage, breast cancer, one, two, three, four, will kind of cover the difference. But overall, you're looking at the size. Small mass, stage one, small mass, a little larger mass, stage two, um, versus stage three is a smaller, large mass with lymph nodes. Stage four, you have distant disease or metastasis. But I'll put a little information and something at the very end of the video that kind of talks about stage um, and it'll give you a lot of good information. Now, as far as survival, here we go. The five-year survival of non-metastatic invasive breast cancer, that's an early breast cancer without positive lymph nodes, is around 90%. DCIS by itself actually has a survival usually of about 95%. So 90% of people will be alive in five years with a non-metastatic invasive breast cancer. Once you start adding regional lymph nodes, you can see that drop off. Now, this is an early, this is a late stage one, stage two. This is a little different, but remember this range goes from 86% down depending on how big the mass is, how many lymph nodes are involved, versus a stage four, five-year survival, distant metastasis, 28%. So that means three-fourths of the women that are diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer will 
not make it to five years. What this is really telling us is it is important, very, 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 very important to focus on self-breast examination and going to the physician or healthcare provider if you have any type of abnormality in your breast. This affects a lot of women because 25 to 50% of adult women will have some type of breast disease that they're affected by. So you need to get in sooner rather than later. This is truly a time game. The sooner you get diagnosed, the sooner you get treatment, overall, the better off you are. Now, having said that, this still occurs in months to years. You don't go from DCIS to breast cancer in two months, in three months. It takes years to get there. So you have time after you're diagnosed to get adequate treatment. So it's not, oh, I got breast cancer, I need you to do surgery tomorrow. Um, we have time to make sure that you get the appropriate procedure, but we first have to get diagnosed. So prior, if you have a problem, just go see your healthcare provider, they will get you taken care of. Now, there are a couple things that we didn't cover. The biggest thing is MRI. MRI is used as a modality in addition to other things. Now, some providers use MRIs for dense breast tissue because we can't screen with adequate mammograms. That's reasonable. The only approved reason to use an MRI of the breast is if you have a woman that presents with lymph node positive disease but we don't have a primary. Again, you have positive lymph nodes for breast cancer because you're gonna go on a biopsy, but we don't know where the primary is. That is the one reason that your insurance will pay for an MRI. Everything else, it's really kind of like cooking a cake. Your breast surgeon may say, well, I wanna get an MRI to look at the other breast. Just because they wanna get it doesn't mean your insurance company is gonna pay for it. So you just have to be careful. Um, with thinking that you have to have an MRI. An MRI right now, from a data standpoint, is optional. Like, um, what else? Um, yes, oh, I forgot. There are some other things like post-treatment. Some people used to do infusion um, directly into the breast cavity. They used to do radiation directly into the breast cavity. When we used to do um, breast operations we used to disfigure women by removing everything breast cancer treatment changes so it's important to make sure you talk to your health care provider and figure out what is best for you but as far as from a patient standpoint this is a pretty good framework if you have any questions dm me instagram call my office whatever we'll get them taken care of good luck thanks for tuning in All right, this is Christine's section. So anytime I miss anything, Christine points it out. Um, say hi. Hi. She's not, <laughs> she, she doesn't like the camera, but I'll, <laughs> I'll flash her up here in a second when she's doing a little cute thing. Um, yes, family history. So family history right now is a first degree relative with a breast cancer diagnosed earlier than 50. When we talk about breast cancer, we think about sporadic breast cancers they usually occur in women older than 50. so if you have someone as younger than 50 that's a female that has breast cancer there's a chance that they have a, pre a genetic predisposition brca genes under some p53 mutations or a bunch of them out there so anyone diagnosed under the age of 50 we have them go through genetic testing now a couple of things one the person that we're doing the genetic testing on usually is the one with breast cancer. And then once they do that, then we test everybody else. So it's very hard to come in and say, hey, I had a family member with breast cancer and I want to get genetically screened. It's a history and physical, but we need the person that has breast cancer to get tested first. Simply because there are a lot of different genetic predispositions for breast cancer 
And we need to know which one we're looking for in order to just screen everybody. Now, that is changing, and some of the common ones like BRCA genes we can test for. But again, if we're going to tell you whether it's your risk for a family history of breast cancer, we need to test that person. And traditionally, it's under the age of 50 when they were diagnosed. Another thing is male breast cancer. We didn't touch on it that much, but the, the male breast cancer algorithm is pretty much the same for the women. The symptoms are the same. It's something that we have to keep in the back of our minds and the age is about the exact same. Stage for stage, they, they perform about the same. Having said that, it's not as common. Um, benign lesions of the breast in men typically are more common than men, than, than, um, are more common than cancer, excuse me. And also, just because you have something on your breast doesn't mean it's cancer. We have skin over our breast, so seborrheic keratosis, actinic keratosis, sebaceous cysts, abscesses, melanomas, all of those things can also occur on the skin over the breast. Is that it, Christy? All right, I think we got it, guys. Thanks again. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with thunder with the rain.